So, all right. Um, I think we're ready to go ahead and kick off the program. We are very excited for today's conversation, which is lessons, reflections, and leading at the speed of change. We have two incredible founders with us today, Tracy Lawrence and Shana Tellerman, who have been through the roller coaster of running their own companies and showing exemplary leadership through it all. Leading the conversation is Shalu Garg, who is the managing director of Microsoft for Startups in Silicon Valley and the Southwest region. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Shalu. Thank you so much, Hey everyone, this is uh, Shalu Garg from um, Microsoft. And my first thing is to apologies. In the world that we live in, camera is has suddenly become sort of the message, unfortunately, it's completely lost it today. So I'm just apologies for that. Uh, a big hello to everyone. I can see that all folks from around the world have uh, and thank you very much for taking time. I also want to thank um, Silicon Valley Forum for. It's so hard um, to hear you right now. Really? Can you hear me now? No, it's it's kind of like all warbly. Do you have the, your okay, headset on? on? No, actually, I don't. I don't. Hold on one second. Yeah, I would put the headset. Maybe that can. Can you hear me now? Mm, try it again. Let's see. Yeah. It's not a talk without tech difficulties, is it? <laughs> okay. Um, this. Uh, keep talking and see. Is it better? Um, no, still uh, kind of warbly. Yeah. It is okay. Um, okay, I. I just call back in. Will that help? And maybe call in with the phone. I don't know if you're calling through your computer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that right now. Thank you. And and maybe when she does that, we can maybe we want to start with introductions for ourselves, so we don't waste people's time at all. That would be yeah. great. Thank you. Cool. Um, cool. Well, I'll get started. Um, so I. It's funny because I'm I'm not a founder right now but I literally just sold my company Choose about two months ago. Um, so I, I'm having this like reverse imposter syndrome where I'm like, oh my God, I'm not doing the hard thing right now. Uh, but I, I started my company Choose about a decade ago um, and I was in college uh, and I was an event planner. And it was at that time that I started to work with a bunch of restaurants and a bunch of offices and the offices were sick of Subway. They wanted to order some great food for their teams and for meetings. And I started to step in the middle of the transactions with a basically a Microsoft template and, a, uh, and an e-fax line, because that's what all the restaurants were taking orders with, with fax. And, uh, and so I, that's how Choose was born. And basically, we delivered office meals um, from local restaurants. And we operated in four cities across the US. We raised about 40 million in venture capital, grew the company to about 300 employees, and then sold it uh, two months ago. And I got my butt kicked along the way. I think I made like every mistake under the sun. I, I made some of them twice, which is even more embarrassing. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to share more today. Great. Thank you, Tracy. Excellent. Awesome. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me better? Yeah, better. Much better. Thank you. Thank you. So sorry about that. As I said, you know, the new world that we live in. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Tracy, for being a trooper there. Yeah, really no. appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give it away to Shanna. And then, of course, you know, I'll take it back and quickly introduce myself as well. So the ever smiling Shanna, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? All right. Sounds great. Um, so, yeah, so it's funny. Tracy and I, I think I met when I was in a, not my startup mode. And now here I am back in the middle of it. But uh this is my second startup. So I um, entered uh, being an entrepreneur in a totally unexpected way, ended up starting my first company out of graduate school, not planning to start a company, but working on a project I could not imagine putting on the shelf. It was also in the 3D technology space. We ended up acquired by Autodesk. Um, I ran that company for five years. And I always say the same thing you just said, Tracy, which is I made just about every mistake under the sun 
Um, and, uh, and I thought that maybe that would help me with the second company and, and it helped a little bit, but I can tell you, you make a whole new suite of mistakes on your second startup. <laughs> I don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I think the learnings and the mistakes and, and all of that is actually part of the process. It's actually, um, as I've, I've been doing it now for, uh, over 10 years of running startups, I feel like, um, that's really like, that's the core of it. That's actually the fun part. It's, it's what you learn. So my last company was acquired. Uh, I worked at Google Ventures for a little while, um, sat on the other side of the table investing in startups, and then uh, could not Im imagine how to design my home when my husband and I moved into a, a home together in San Francisco. Um, picking out furniture or imagining how it all looked together was just like mind boggling for me. And with a 3D visualization background, I just had this dream of a better way to design your home. And uh, before I knew it, I was on to my second company, Modsy. And so we use 3D visualization technology to provide an online interior design service. And uh, we're about five years in. We've raised a little over 80 million. Um, we have a couple hundred uh, employees and designers. And uh, we're off to the races, learning a whole new set of uh, issues and challenges and problems along the way. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Shanna. I really appreciate that. And uh, very inspiring journeys and backgrounds, uh, both Tracy and Shanna. I'll, I'll quickly chime in and I'll redo my intro for just 60 seconds here. So hello, everyone. My sincere apologies again for the little technical glitch there. My name is Shalu Garg, and I am the Managing Director at Microsoft for Startups. I have a couple of responsibilities. One is I lead the Global Social Entrepreneurship Program for Microsoft, which is purely targeted towards social entrepreneurs. And we go around the world, we pick the best of the best, and we make our goal is to help them be successful. And the other is um, I lead the business for Silicon Valley, which is how I work with phenomenal partners like Silicon Valley Forum here, just making sure that our journeys are aligned, our goals are aligned. I am super excited to be here because this is one of my favorite topics, like female founders, bring them together with leading change and being a catalyst for change. I mean, what better topic than, than this? So um, Shanna and Tracy, I want to pose this question to each one of you. Uh, we can start with you, Tracy, first. Tell, me a little, tell us about, a little bit about your journey, like your personal journey. How did you, what led you to be an entrepreneur? So um, my parents were entrepreneurs together. They started a company in LA. Uh, it was a fashion company. So my mom was a designer and my dad was sales. And um, it was because of that that I said I would never be a founder <laughs> because every night over dinner, they would like argue about HR and inventory. And I was like, I just want to talk about my food. Like I do not want to do, and I was like, I'm never going to start my own business because I don't want to bring my, you know, business back to the dinner table. And um, lo and behold, of course, my business is about like eating. <laughs> so of course this like, this makes sense, but I, I was really resistant to it. And I explained a little bit in my intro about how, when I was, when I was in, in college as an event planner, I just kind of saw the opportunity and that's, I, I'd say that the business opportunity was what presented itself first and what really catalyzed my journey. Um, but actually the thing that I discovered probably about three or four years into it with the help of an executive coach was much deeper than that. And I, I went to this, the CEO reboot kind of like this boot camp is what they call it. But really it was like group therapy and it was 15 CEOs and it was the whole range from pre fundraising to exit and earn out. And not one person was happy. Mm. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm like, my God, you know, what's going on? And we, we start talking about things from, from childhood. You know, a lot of people are divorced. A lot of people are very unhappy. Their kids hate them. There's this, this whole range of, of things that we bring into our personal lives as CEOs. And I started to talk about when I was younger, how I was bullied. And, um, you know, I, I was bullied so badly as a kid that I used to eat lunch in the bathroom. Um, and, and my coach kind of leans over and he's like, tell me again what your business does. And I was like, oh, I was like, I, I guess we make sure that nobody eats alone. And that's why we did family style meals, you know? And, and it was kind of in that moment, and I still kind of get like, like tingles thinking about it. Cause that was the moment where I realized I didn't just start the company cause it was a business opportunity. I also started it because there was like this deep, like pain in my own heart of being 
lonely and eating alone as a kid that I kind of wanted to solve for the world. Um, so I'd say that that was probably a big part of, of what started the journey for me and, and, you know, building human connection and authentic connection will always be a part of that, that journey. That's fantastic. I, um, I love that, uh, you know, you're so vulnerable. You just openly shared about having, you know, these dinner table conversations with your parents and how you didn't want to be an entrepreneur. Right. And those are the things that we carry through our lives while growing up. So thank you for your candor there. Really appreciate it. Uh, Shannon, over to you. What's your story? Yeah. I mean, I also didn't really have any plans to be an entrepreneur. I kind of alluded to it, but, um, I went into an uh, undergrad for fine arts. So I loved painting actually wow. oil painting, uh, like large scale oil paintings. And I liked math and science, but I couldn't figure out like where do those two things like truly marry together. Um, and I went to Carnegie Mellon where supposedly they like, it's very interdisciplinary and they have these incredible disciplines, both in art and science, computer science, et cetera. But I just like couldn't find the place where they connected in a way that didn't feel really superficial. Um, especially when I was in college, like the way that design was applied to anything engineering was sort of like, we've finished the hard work, now can you make it look pretty on the surface? <laughs> um, and there wasn't that sort of like collaboration together. And then I took a class in virtual reality, um, actually at that time taught by the now famous uh, professor Randy Pouch, who wrote the last lecture, um, which I highly recommend if you haven't seen that. Um, but I took this VR class and it, like, it just changed my whole life. I was uh, blown away by finding the one place that I felt like storytelling and art and creativity and engineering, like they went hand in hand. Neither one could actually work without the other. Um, and before I knew it, that like catapulted me into this whole career track, which I didn't even know existed. So I went to graduate school for entertainment technology. We started using video games to train emergency responders post 9-11. Um, in a world where like, you know, m much like today, like the world had been turned upside down and there was all these new threats that they had to be trained for and they didn't have training solutions and games were a really natural fit. So I just got kind of launched into this career track where I fell in love with working with people that came from different backgrounds and had different skill sets and like bringing it all together so that we could create something that not each one, none of us could individually create on our own. And I think that that has been, for me, the theme that's kept me in entrepreneurship is the idea of like creating something, but like not, not doing it on my, on my own or by myself, but really like being a part of a team where each one of us brings a unique skill set, and together we're able to create something that is unique and new in the world. That's fascinating. So um, I'm quickly going to share my journey. Obviously, I'm not an entrepreneur, but I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and I've, I've been doing that for many years. But let me share a little bit about my personal journey. So I grew up in Middle East and my dad was an aeronautical engineer and all he worked on was those Boeing 747s. Those planes were really fancy way back then, although I'm not that old just for the record. But, um, you know, during my school years, I literally had, I had to go to 11 different schools between elementary and uh, high school. That's the kind of environment that I grew in, which is every year I'm making new friends. I'm studying in different schools. And I remember when I was in sixth grade, uh, I had, my neighbor was my best friend. And I noticed that every day I would go to school, but she wouldn't. And it always bothered me. I was actually very jealous. I was like, how come I need to, I have to go to school and she gets to play at home and I have to study for these exams and she doesn't, you know, it was, it bothered me for many years, but then I constantly asked this, like, why, why, why is that? And then later when I was doing my master's, I took technology as an elective, one of the papers that I took. And, you know, I started understanding the broader dynamics how, of how technology can help. And of course, you know, just keeping the global acumen in mind, uh, my derivation was my best friend could not go to school because the community and the society did not allow her to. So I, my personal journey is I went on it and I said, hey, if girls are not allowed to go to school, guess what? Let's bring the school to them. And so in that effort, I am part of the United Nations. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm part, I'm, I'm, a champion of innovation there where I'm pushing the agenda of technology 
uh, in almost every aspect uh, of where we have conservative thinking. And that includes, uh, of course, very closely aligned with entrepreneurship. That's why I'm totally fascinated by this space. I love working with founders, you know, just, just hearing their personal story and, of course, deriving um, their, their business models and how it can help. So that's my personal story. I'm going to ask you a million dollar question, both of you. <laughs> there is so much talk in the market that for female founders, access to capital is the number one impediment. And there is an inherent pipeline issue. I am going to ask you both, both being female founders, right? What's been your biggest challenge besides access to capital? Shana, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as a female founder, for me, the, the thing that I have always, it's always struck me is that um, you're sort of paved, you feel like you're paving your own path the whole time. Like there's, there's really a, a lack of a similar feeling and looking leader that is a household name, right? Like yeah. when we think about the founders out there that have changed the world and changed our lives, like we think of Steve Jobs, we think of Bill Gates, you know, we think of Mark Zuckerberg, we think of these names that are iconic and we're really missing kind of the female counterpart that started the business and became that tech, especially tech founder, leading successful female founder. And so I've found that, that for me, that, that often means that like I'm role modeling myself against a, like a little bit of a vacuum. Like I'm, I feel like I'm making it up. And when I look at the, the, like the male styles, they don't always resonate with me. And when I think about the way that I want to do it, I, you know, I will find myself questioning, like, is this the right way? Is it going to work? And I think for, you know, for a team following a female founder, the same thing, like the style is going to be different and it's often then going to be compared against the male counterparts that they may have worked for or their friends worked for. And so you're in this, this world where you're constantly being compared against people who just, you know, fundamentally they're operating differently. Yeah. And Shannon, how did you, how did you lead through the change? Like you were challenged. How did you lead through the complexities that you came across? Yeah. I mean, but I still am right. Like, you know, we're, we're certainly in a complex moment at the moment. Um, and I think like for me, I have just gotten more and more comfortable trusting my instincts to just be authentic, right? Like the more that I feel like I am genuinely doing the thing the way that I believe I should be doing it and that I feel like I should be doing it, just the more confident I am. But I think also the more comfortable that feeling is for my team and for those around me because yeah. they feel like there's no, there's no guard, there's no filter. I am just being genuinely who I am. And that's the only way I've found to lead through. Yeah, that's... Complexity, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's amazing. Tracy, let me ask you this. In, in the world that we live in, obviously challenges are around us. Uh, firstly, I would love to hear what were some of the challenges that you faced? And then how did you challenge the status quo? Besides the dinner table conversation, which I'm still fascinated about. <laughs> <laughs> the trauma. Um, <laughs> I mean, very similar vibes here. And, and I'll kind of connect the two actually of the idea of like leading with authenticity and the fundraise. Because as a founder, you spend so much time working with other founders on your pitch and fundraising. Like I literally spent probably about two thirds of my time at Choose either prepping for actively fundraising or wrapping up a fundraise. It's just, it's so much of your time when you're venture backed. And, and um, I, I asked a lot of people and a lot of men, right? A lot of the, my, my mentors and a lot of other founders are mostly men. And I asked them how they did it. And there's a very stylistic way of raising money um, in the Valley that is very male. And yeah. And male is neither good nor bad in the same way that female, I believe, is neither good nor bad. It just is stylistic. And like, it's the kind, it's almost like dating, right? They'll be like, well, you have to be a total dick, you know, to the VC. And you can't, you, you can't act like you want them too much because then, you know, then they're going to know that you're desperate. And it's like, oh my God, like that is not, first off, that's not how I date, you know, but that's, that's kind of the way that, that Silicon Valley has taken to doing it. And what I ended up finding, and I, like when I tried that style, it just fell really flat. 
And I remember having an investor who we were super close to closing. And he, um, we were at the final stages of sort of the diligence process before he was going to invest. And he calls me up the day he's supposed to visit us. And he says, um, he says we, we spoke to your customers and they love the product. They say it's one of the best products they've used in the office. But unfortunately, we can't invest. Like, yeah. Really? And he's like, because we don't believe that your team is out for blood. And this is a very hard industry because you're building a local marketplace. Yeah. And I, I was in this little studio in Hayes Valley and I was like, I don't know, I, must, I was like 23 or 24. And I just like, I, I thanked him, I hung up and I just cried for like the rest of the day. And I, I really questioned like, do I belong in, in the tech world? Like, am I too soft? Am I ever going to succeed? Is he right? Um, and, and what I ended up coming around to was that he, he was definitely right that I wasn't out for blood. And I, what I was out for in tandem was sort of discovering my past or rediscovering it was like, I was actually out for love. And I really wanted to build a company where our customers love us, which is why we're number one, and where a culture where our team loves us. And it just, even like I realized that and we became what we called a love company. And it was very opinionated and some people loved it and some people hated it. And we hugged each other and we expressed gratitude and had some good stuff. But I think it was just, and I still to this day, feel a little bit uncomfortable saying that, you know, like we're a love company, you know, we, we like a leading with heart. I know Shauna, yeah. you mentioned that, right? That that's like one yeah. of your values, which I love. Um, but it's still something where I, I still have the question till this day. Um, you know, am I, am I too soft? Should I push harder? Um, am I being, you know, too, too feminine and too soft, right? Yeah. But I think it's also a femininity that's also very, that can be very radical and also very firm right? And very boundaried. And so I think it's learning that was one of my, and still is one of my biggest leadership challenges. Yeah. And, you know, just to add to that or build upon that, Tracy, I think being feminine can actually sometimes be beneficial to a business problem or a business situation because, and, and I don't mean being feminine only comes from a female, like what it means is just a different perspective, right? right. And I have personally found myself to be extremely, extremely astute while making business decisions because the situation demanded me to do that. But at times I'm more on the feminine side where I'm like, hey, I need to lead with softness here. I need to lead with my heart here because that's what the situation demands. So super interesting. Um, lead with mind or lead with heart. We talked about the challenges, right? Let me ask you this. There has to be an upside of being the only woman in the room. What were some of the opportunities that you found that really helped you sort of navigate the path? I can definitely share many experiences that I had in terms of just bringing a different perspective to the table very strongly and very authoritatively that this is the way things are going to move. I would love to hear uh, what your perspective is. Tracy, you want to go first since you're up there? Sure. Yeah. I mean, for first off, you're just a talent magnet. Like people, I, I find that, that talent today is attracted to diverse cultures and inclusive cultures in general, right? They, they yeah. want to feel good about where they're working and the culture that they work at. And so people would see a female CEO and rightly or wrongly, okay, they'd be like, sign me up. I'm like, you know, you should, we should get to know each other. You should know my weaknesses because like I'm a yeah. human, right? But, but for the most part, like you found that, that I could attract talent um, that that because like our culture and this feminine way of leadership really resonated with them. And, and I also think that being a woman, you, I don't know, this, this feminine style of leadership, right. Which again is not only owned by women. I think when men yeah. sit in that, it's actually very inspiring, but it, it's a very inspirational way of leading when you can lead with heart. Cause it's so connecting, you know? And I, I remember like, I, I like vulnerability, I think, is more accepted as a female leader. And I yeah. was able to say things, you know, and, and say when I was scared. I remember telling the company when we were 
six months away from running out of cash before we raised our series a how sad i would be not to be able to work with them and like i had tears in my eyes and everybody had tears in their eyes and like it was a very connecting moment and nobody left the company for the next six months and we almost went bankrupt you know but like there's almost some of that that i can get away with more as a woman um and and in a leadership role than i think my male counterparts can which is super isn't fair yeah very cool. Shanna, you want to take a shot at this? Yeah, well, I mean, I agree with both the things you said, both in terms of talent, like we've uh, constantly and, and even just had an incredible, incredible senior female engineering manager hire who said, I'm tired of working with guys. <laughs> like, I want to work on a team where there's some inspiring female leaders. Um, and we were like blown away. She like hunted us down and spent like months and months waiting to join the company. Uh, wow. So, that, so that's for sure. And then same thing, like on the leadership side, I think that the ability to just be super authentic, super vulnerable, um, tell it like it is. I do Friday emails where I just kind of um, see free form, talk about what's on my mind. And I feel extremely comfortable just being totally who I am. And I think, again, like partially like what I was saying before, it's because I do feel like I'm paving my own path. There's not any model of what I'm trying to be that I feel constrained by. Um, but I also don't feel like I'm trying to hide my emotions at any point. Like I am happy to tell people when I'm sad about something, when I'm frustrated, when I feel fearful about our business, like that feels like emotions that are completely accepted. And I, and I think both our male and female employees really benefit from that. And I, in fact, I hear from just as many men uh, as women that it's really refreshing to feel like so connected to the, to the CEO. Um, I'd say the only other thing for me is really that, um, there are opportunities. I mean, you know, it, we, you mentioned at the beginning, like there's just, it's, there are less women who have been, who found companies, but also especially end up getting, raising venture capital. And the later stage you get, the, the less and less there are around you of companies that are of your size and scale. And so there is opportunity in being unique. Um, and that, that is everything from press opportunities to, um, you know, to again, employees wanting to join you to certainly there are investors out there seeking companies to invest in that are minority or female started. And that is a benefit at times. So, uh, you know, you have, you have to take those gems when you can get them and they're, they're out there if you uncover them. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Both of you, uh, use the same words, vulnerability, softness, I heard hard as well. And I also heard a common theme, which is, you know, at times, um, you know, it's, it's always, it's also a similar behavior that our male counterparts demonstrate. So at the end of the day, it's not really about gender, right? But still in the investment landscape, it is pretty much the, the, the ball game is played with gender, but that's a separate conversation altogether. I want to share a little, just very short story with you. Um, Years ago, I was working with a female founder who was very frustrated. She had an amazing business model. She was based out of Israel. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with the global uh, startup ecosystem, most of the Israeli startups look for business deals in either New York or Silicon Valley. That's like US is their primary market. And she was based in Israel and I was working with her. I was mentoring her. She was also part of my portfolio. And uh, she was at a point where she was extremely frustrated. She was like, you know what? I, when I walk in the room, it's always about, hey, you know, how many kids do you have? Or uh, you may want to leave. It's like 3.30. It's time to pick kids. And she was just really tired of the sm snarky remarks. And she said, I would get very upset. I would get angry. And I would yell at people and say, you don't, you cannot talk to me this way. And then later, um, a couple of years later, I got a super, very inspirational email from her. And the subject said, I cracked it. And I was like, huh, what has she been up to? And I opened the email and, and she wrote a beautiful story. She said, it was my own journey of realizing where I was going wrong. I read many books. I attended many forums. I listened to many women talking about a similar issue, but I could not relate to the solution that they offered. So ultimately, what she said is, I leveled up my, my EQ, which is emotional question. And she said, I leveled up my EQ. And every time anyone, a, fa a female or a male would say, hey, it's time for me to, it's time for you to go, go pick up your kids. Like, what are you doing here raising funding? Yeah. I would ask them and say, hey, you know, how many kids do you have? 
and uh, a boy or a girl, how old are they? And shouldn't you be going as well? And so it was an interesting journey and it was a self-realization journey, how she explained where she had literally gone into depression just by the, the way, you know, the whole, the whole scenario was, but I wanted to throw it out there. I know we have three minutes here. Um, what's your words of wisdom, Shana? Any words of wisdom for our audience here? I think the main is really, it is a long and hard journey um, and that the obstacles that you face along the way are inevitable. And in fact, you know, in, in hindsight, those obstacles are the, the things that have taught me the most. Yeah, fantastic. Tracy? Um, I, I think we should, we really should elevate the story for ourselves. You know, Sh Shalu, in that example that you shared, that story, the reason that women go into this depression, and I've seen this happen before, is that like we feel completely disempowered, right? If we don't have access to capital and the world is out to get us. But I actually, I, I encourage us to think about it differently. Because if you're living, especially if you're living in you know a Western country and particularly in Silicon Valley, there's so many opportunities. And I think we can't allow our, I, I have this concept of sort of these two boxes. Like one is the box that everybody is born with and it's kind of like got grooves and shapes. It like fits you and it's the natural limitations of the world and every human has them, right? So it's like genetics, it's disease. Sometimes if you're born into a culture that's super sexist or racist, like that's a real box. But sometimes for women and minorities, we kind of create this second box that's actually more, that's smaller and more constricting. And we see the world through a lens of like, everyone's out to get us and I can't get to where I want. And, and I think we have to break free of that. And, you know, I've, I've definitely seen it with, with a, there was a female founder who I mentored and she went to a, a funding pitch and she got rejected and she said, oh, it's because I, I'm a woman. I was like, did he say that? And she was like, no, but he said my vision was too small. So I was like, pitch me your vision. And we talked through the vision. I was like, I hate to tell you, but it is too small. But like, here, we can work on this and work on this. And she was like, oh, cool. I can work on it. It's like, it's a skill set, right? Like anything else. And so I think as long as we stay open and curious and open to learning, then being a woman can totally be your asset, whether you're a founder or just a, a, or a leader or anybody at a company. And so I, I hope that we can keep that mindset and stay curious because there's a lot of opportunity for us right now. Fantastic. Um, I have three words of wisdom. I'm gonna take one on each. So there are three, three ladies here on the panel. So number one is embrace failure open, I mean, with an open heart, just, welcome it because failure is the path to success. You have no idea how many entrepreneurs I meet with on daily basis, male or females, doesn't matter. Some of them are doing phenomenally well. Others, like I can go on and on with stories. Founders who I met three years ago, almost on the verge of giving, are today one of the top startups in Silicon Valley right? There's a story there. They're all, they were not all born rock stars. They went through a lot of failures and a lot of, lot of, you know, just a lot of really sad stories that I've come across. But I'm a firm believer that, you know, failure is a path to success, number one. Number two is male counterparts are are, are allies. Like, they're, right. I, I've got to tell you, in my personal career, my biggest supporters and sponsors in my workplace has have been males they are our allies let's just you know utilize them let's let's just have them champion for us that would be phenomenal and third thing is train our brain muscle and i remind this you know every every day just just think about it every morning is let's train our brain muscle to give back um and it's a very popular quote from um house of cards when Kevin Spacey says, every time you take up the elevator, make sure to send it down. It's super critical to give back, whatever. Like what I'm doing right now is actually just giving back. I love doing this. So with that, um, I want to thank uh, Tracy and Shana for a phenomenally energetic conversation. And uh, we'll open it up for Q&A. Excellent. So we should be able to, um, Shelley, you should be able to open up the chat box. Yes, I can see group chat. 
and uh, I do not see any questions, but I see a comment from Karen Conwell. There's a new book out, Alpha Girls, about a few of the first female VCs. I'm only halfway through. Awesome. I'm going to pick it up, Karen. Thank you so much <laughs> for the recommendation there. Thank you. It's, it's really, um, it's really written like a novel. So it really, yeah. really and it's quite, um, it's quite racy. I didn't think that I would find any things in there that um, hadn't happened to me, but I did. <laughs> so That's um, amazing. Good read. How did you come across it? Did somebody recommend it to you or? There is a whole series that unfortunately just rolled out this year of women doing spectacular things in there included their book along with several others were included in this series. And I, I went to a thing at De Anza College, right, where they talked. They did a presentation and then, you know, signed books and stuff. And I almost didn't buy one, but I got to tell you, I'm really glad I did because it's fabulous. Awesome. I'm going to pick a copy up. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. The line sure. of thinking is pretty interesting, too, in this question and in in what you wrote here, just about, like, are the female investors really emulating the male style? Um, and, uh, you know, I spent a, a short amount of time, but I was an investor for a little while at Google Ventures. And I do think that it's interesting to try to kind of differentiate what is part of being an investor. Mm. Like you have to be fairly competitive, right? Cause you're, it's a, you're a lone shark, like you're out to win a deal <laughs> and to make the most money, you have to find the best deals and you have to invest in the best deals and you have to get in early when you can get evaluation that's ultimately going to return maximum. You. So, right, like there's a part of the setup that is like the nature of the job that maybe we characterize as male, but like to do the job, you do have to be competitive. Um, you do have to be social, like you have to be out there and meeting people. Um, I think there's stylistically like how you might uh, engage with people, talk to people, whether like how you listen, both as part of the partnership and how you listen to entrepreneurs. Like those are some of the stylistic differences. And um, I've seen, a, I have seen a number of both women and men that are very, very good at engaging on the human level, despite being in this competitive field and easily say no to deals, <laughs> but don't make you feel like crap, right? Uh, afterwards. And then I think that kind of more traditional mindset of like, they're going to be kind of an asshole to you and be short on time and cut you short. Right. But that, that there's both men and women who have that style as well. Uh, but anyway, just got me thinking about that. That's great. I have a question. We have a question here from D. I hope I'm pron pronouncing your uh, name correctly. Great question. Do you have mentors or sponsors? Are, are they also women? What do you gain from these folks and how do you find them? Fantastic question. Um, Tracy, you want to you wanna take that? Or Shanna, you want to take that? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick off. Um... You know, I've, I've actually found it much more of an organic process. Like instead of like, I need to go find a mentor, I'm kind yeah. of out meeting people and looking for peers and friends and inspiration. And then yeah. the people that I naturally, especially in Silicon Valley, I mean, so many, so many generous people that are willing to grab a coffee with you. It's insane. If you get a warm introduction to me, it's like, yeah, like I'll, I'll grab a coffee. I'll chat with you. I'll, I'll help you out. And when I found some of those people you click with, some of them you don't, that's okay. Yeah. Um, one of, so actually from that boot camp, um, I met another CEO named Bobby Brannigan and Bobby ended up investing in my company and became a mentor of mine. And, and he, and, and kind of gave me, I like to have mentors kind of from with kind of a bunch of different specialties, but he's like a fellow CEO in the trenches, but who has also sold his company before. And, and actually he is the reason that I am right now working at Mercado because right after I sold the company, I told myself I was going to go on a mini retirement, which was like, you know, hang out for a few months and relax. And he called me up and said, you know, my company is absolutely blowing up and everything is breaking due to coronavirus. And, that, and that's Mercado where I am right now. And I'm, I'm on a couple month contract to support his team, but they're doing specialty grocery deliveries. But that's one of those examples where he became, he was a friend, he became an investor, a mentor. You know, now I get to partner with him on this amazing project. And so I would encourage you, sometimes I get asked like, oh, will you be my mentor? And it's kind of like asking someone like, will you, 
will you be in a relationship with me? And it's like, well, yeah. you know, I think that there's still has to be a chemistry. Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and you have to make absolutely. sure they can add value to you, you know, because exactly. they may not yeah. be able to, to be honest. And you should exactly. Get- and I have a, it's such a great point, Tracy, because I've noticed that as well. A lot of, lot of uh, folks come to me and say, hey, can you be my mentor? And ultimately what I find is they want a job, which is fine, right? I mean, it's, that's called networking. So there is, a, there is a very fine difference between networking and mentoring. Mentoring is like a relationship where you're actually coaching someone, you're, you're guiding them, and uh, the chemistry is extremely important. So thank you for that. I see a lot of questions coming in. So I'm going to go between the three of us and whoever wants to pick it up, let's do it. So Mariana has an amazing question. Mariana, thank you so much for, for bringing this up. You mentioned the obstacles as women in the industry, but as a college student, I face even more obstacles. Do you have some advice for female college students? Who wants to take this? Shanna, you want to give it a shot, Tracy? Uh, I mean, I'm, sh- I'm happy to talk about my own experience. I think it's very unique like to each person. So I'd love to know what obstacles specifically you're facing. I went to an engineering, engineering heavy school. And as I got more into computer science and especially into entertainment technology and virtual reality, I was amongst a really small number of women in my class. Um, but I will, I'll tell you, I, at that time, I found it to be um, actually gender was less of an issue than it has become later in life. And so I, I do think that it is the, it's like good training grounds maybe, or it's kind of a good um, uh, natural segue into kind of things you might face later in life. So I don't know specifically what this person is, has been facing that they're trying to overcome. But for me, I think getting comfortable speaking up was like one of the first things that I had to get comfortable, like just being confident in the things I was saying, raising my hand, what helped me there was honestly was group projects and teamwork, um, uh, being part of teams that presented projects rather than being, you know, like kind of solely responsible for answering things. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then that, like I said, that, that place where I ended up finding that was this balance between the creative and the engineering because there was no right answer. So going into a space that was not so black and white, like math was, um, where it could be really fast and be like, this is the answer. And you're either right or wrong and somebody's the best and somebody's fastest and somebody's slowest in the class. Um, once we moved into the much more gray zone, which a lot of engineering now is, is the same thing. And a lot of computer science is the same thing. There's no right or wrong. Um, I found that uh, both I was more confident and people were more receptive to my answers. And I felt more comfortable in that territory um, because again, it was a little bit maybe less competitive in the same way. You still wanted to make the best project, but you really worked as a team to do it and respected each other's contributions. That's, that's great perspective. Thank you, Shanna. Man, this group is on fire. I'm seeing these questions coming and I'm like, I love these questions. I'm going to put up another one. It's from Eugenio. I'm really sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, do you regularly work with other women in small groups for accountability or motivation? Something very, very unique, right? So it's basically, I think if I understand the question correctly, it's like, do we work with, small, with, with women in small groups mm. who may come from different backgrounds, different needs, you know, for accountability or motivation? So I've got a group, uh, I've got a WhatsApp group of women that I met. So, I, so we joined 500 startups, which is why I moved up to San Francisco in the first place. And it, from there, my first network into San Francisco started. And by the way, if you're a first time founder, joining, you know, one of an accelerator program is amazing. Um, it's God, it, it taught me so, so much and, and built my network. But it's a group of women. We call ourselves the feministas. I mean, to no one but ourselves, really. And we have little retreats on weekends. We have a WhatsApp group. We send each other motivation. And like, you know, what's funny is sometimes the topic of like the female perspective and lens on founder issues comes up. But a lot of times it's just like, hey, I'm having this HR issue or who has a really good lawyer or, and it's just, it's just a support group of awesome founders who have share a lot of similar values and it is a wonderful source of inspiration as well as just like being a founder is really lonely sometimes 
right? And even if you have a partner, it's really lonely because oftentimes they're not a founder. And if they are, then God, they're in their own neck of problems, right? So, so you're kind of dealing with, with your issues, but you have to, it kind of keeps the context that you're not alone. And I find that that group of women, they're like, they're extremely supportive. And they're like, oh my God, I did that. I made this mistake. I hope you can learn through it. And it's really nice. That's amazing. Thank you. I know we are about time here, but I'll take one last question, Denise, if it's okay, Denise and Mandy. Um, yeah. It's a very, very, very good question. And, you know, I, I would love both your perspective on this. It's from Priyanka Kale. Uh, she says, what keeps you motivated for being in the startup business? How do you keep yourself mentally strong will to sail through the ups and down financial impacts and juggle through personal priorities? So, what's what's the secret sauce of mental strong mental health let's not go towards wine <laughs> um, i guess for me i feel like uh like everything else in life you kind of have to be in good shape <laughs> right yeah. like you need sleep like i think that when i've gone through periods where i work like crazy hours i don't make my best decisions so like i have it's a marathon like i've prioritized sleeping well eating well taking time off going on vacation spending time with family running like all those like things that everybody says is like good for your life anyway is also good for a really hard job and for me like that like it doesn't matter you're gonna turn around and it's happened you know this is my second startup of now five years also every three months you turn around and there's like another hurdle in front of you and there's another wall and there's another thing and you walk in one day and you're like, everything's great. I'm so excited. And then some, you know, your favorite person walks up and says, I'm quitting. <laughs> it's just like, you know, you're just, you're always in for it. There's always something to yeah. you. And so you just kind of, you like, you need your, your mind to be sharp and ready. And like, you need to be able to just go in and say like, I'm strong. <laughs> and I can get through this. I've got through it before. And that means like, you can't be tired and you can't be run down and you can't be sick. Right. Like all of those things are the things that when those happen, like I've had that those days too, like then you go in the bathroom and you cry for an hour. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Facing it front, front on. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, this reminds me of a quote by Coco Chanel and the quote is, a woman who doesn't wear perfume has no future. So maybe that could be, <laughs> that could be another thing. And I've, I've heard just crazy things, especially now during COVID, you know, every time I meet, even with my colleagues, and it's like, how are you staying sane? And someone just mentioned, like, you know, I just get ready in the morning as if today is my, like, really big meeting. And, you know, these small things matter. Um, Tracy, do you have a perspective on this? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I am in no way do I know the answer, but um, I hope I, I come, I'm coming to it more. I think for what I'm reflecting on with the startup journey is I, I started the company in college. And so I spent my entire 20s building this company and my entire identity was infused into the company, which means that my entire sense of self-worth was infused with the company. So you could map my happiness line with my revenue line like for the first five years. I worked weekends for the first seven. And the only reason that I stopped working weekends, embarrassingly enough, was that I fell in love. And I was like, you know, there are other things that are important. And in fact, more important than my startup. And that gave me the buffer I needed because I, I, was, I was coming close to sort of burning out. And I needed that buffer to know that there are things that are valuable because your startup is most likely going to fail. And too many times that failure takes the entrepreneur down with it. Yeah. Can't let that happen. That's a very unhealthy ecosystem. And so I, I was very open with the team. Um, I have a therapist and a coach. Um, I, I'm a surfer. And so I, I surf, you know, three to four times a week. And, and so whatever that, that is for you, but it's like, I, my mantra now is I need to start and end the day with myself, especially during coronavirus. It's yeah. so easy to just turn on that laptop and start working and then close it and go right to bed from bed. <laughs> That's the horrible part of all of it. And so I, I make one to two hours when I wake up 
and when I go to bed that are just for me. Because I have to remember, like you start and end the day with yourself. The business is something you work on and hopefully, you know, to, to Shauna's point, it's like, it should be fun, right? And there should be, or maybe not fun. It, there, these are problems that should be in, 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 a, in a way enjoyable to solve. And that doesn't mean that they're joyful, but you know, I am starting to see what does it look like to solve problems and fail, but still enjoy the journey of it. Um, but that's, I think that is my, my struggle as well. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I know we are about time here. Uh, I just wanted to thank our fabulous panelists for being so vulnerable and so honest. And I wanted to thank the awesome Denise and the awesome Mandy and the awesome Silicon Valley forum for pulling this together and making this happen. Thank you very much. Over to you, Denise. Thank you so much. Um, it was a very illuminating conversation. Thank you to all our panelists and thank you, Shalu, for leading this conversation. Um, just wanna bring up a couple of events that we have coming up that may be of interest to the audience here. Um, so next, um, next Thursday, May 21st, we have a, um, a webinar on how to foster inclusivity in your workplace. And we've got some great speakers for that. And then we have on May 26th is Women and Money. And we have um, one of the women from Elevest coming to speak to us about that, um, managing your money during and post the COVID-19 era. So hopefully you can enjoy, you can join us on either or both of those um, programs. So again, thank you to everyone and um, hope to see you all soon and stay healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.